A disruptor throws everything off balance, changes history, and forces everyone to play catch up. A disruptor is a car that, that comes in and sets a trend, but it's not just literally setting a trend like saying it's a pretty shape. That's not disruptive, but coming in with something that is outrageous, really, and setting a standard that everybody else has to live up to. For nearly 70 years, Porsche has been disrupting the status quo with a history of groundbreaking innovations from the 356 in the 40s to the 911 in the 60s. In this decade's 918 Spider, Porsche's vehicle designs break the mold over and over again. These iconic cars became influencers for their generations and the generations that followed. Visions of beauty, science in the design, form, function, intelligent performance. And now another disruptor has joined the group. Porsche is always blazing a trail and always looking to the future. This is Porsche. Decades of disruption. Going against the grain is one of the biggest things that I think Porsche especially has done for decades. They've, they've gone their own direction. Doesn't matter what the industry is doing, they have an idea, they chase it, they perfect it. In the 1940s, the car industry came to a crashing halt during the war. Afterwards, car makers hurried to stake their claim on the new and growing market. And one man changed the game by creating the car of his dreams. Ferry Porsche said I was looking for the sports car of my dreams and I couldn't find it, so I built one. So he created this car in his vision, and boy, did he do a good job. And they bring this bloody Porsche out, and it's, to it's totally off the wall because it's, you know, air-cooled, it's four cylinders, and it's sort of built very light and very nimble. You look at uh, American cars in particular, they're gigantic, you know, there's seven tons of metal wrapped around you, and they're as long as a city block. And then you look at the 356 and you go, what, what's this? <laughs> this is this beautiful little sports car that's peppy and fast, this wonderful sensation of speed without being terrifyingly fast, but that handles uh, far better than anything else that's being built around that time. The 356 was leading the way for Porsche. If you look at the design, you can see the whole Porsche design language. The engine, of course, in the back, the typical Porsche silhouette. We have lightweight building, we have all day usability. And the 356 is also a car which you can use on the racetrack, so you can win on Sunday and drive on Monday. And it's reliable. That was the remarkable thing about it. People were used to cars breaking every time they drove up. I mean, you know, they used to talk about the British products as being, you know, operated by Lucas, the night of darkness. There's a purity to the driving experience in this car. It's a very simple, easy, focused driving experience with nothing extra. No power brakes, no power steering, rarely a radio. You pull, you want the top up, you pull it up. It had nothing it didn't need and everything it did, just, and, and it was geared towards, you know, the, the feeling of driving a car. Everything was around that, and nothing has changed. I mean, Porsche, to this day in the racing, the drivers are what it's about. Usually people see Porsche as a, as a very male brand, but um, it's not true. The very first Porsche customer was a woman when Ferry Porsche wants to start the production of the 356 in Austria and Gmünd, he had to create a budget and for that reason he had to sell the prototype. And this prototype was sold in 1948 to a woman in Zurich. It took until the year 1957 before the car came back to the company and today it's of course one of the most important exhibits in our museum. In the 1950s, car culture took over the planet and the Paris debut of the 550 changed the world of auto racing. Its dominance of motorsport helped introduce Porsche to North American car lovers. The 550 specifically as a race car was minimalism at its finest. You think back to motorsport uh, in a time where it was all about horsepower, it was all about big tires and wheels. Just add more, add more displacement, more tire size, more brakes, and hope you get to the end. And here comes Porsche um, and, and the giant killer. Having less weight is like having more power. It's like having more grip. It's like having better efficiency. Less weight uh, acts on every single thing the car does. To me, when I first look at this car, I just think Porsche and racing. I mean, that is it. 
and you look inside it and you go, look at it, it's so damn basic, you can't believe. But it's functional, and that's what Porsches are about. It's like balsamic vinegar, you know what I mean? It's been processed and processed and really what's necessary, and that's all that's there. Straight, uncut, sports car. The Type 50 Spider was uh, raced by many famous drivers in America, but uh, yeah, there were other celebrities, and of course the most important one was James Dean, and uh, yeah, maybe this is also part of the myth of the 550. That was a car you could drive to the racetrack. You're just like, here, here's my road car, beep, and you just drive up and you get your little bag out and your little leather helmet or whatever the hell they used back then, and then you just go out there and whip everybody's ass and you just drive home, and, you know, have a beer or something. The 911 was Porsche. It didn't have to say Porsche. It was 911. End of story. The 60s saw disruption become the norm. But while many of the era's fads eventually faded away, one iconic disruptor became immortal. When you think of a sports car, you think of a Porsche 911. I don't know that there's any other car that's been that successful. 911 is that car that we've seen from 1965 through to today. And if you see it anywhere in the world, it's known by that shape. There's nothing else like it. Talk about an icon that's grown from a silhouette um, to present day. And when you line those cars up and you see where the evolution has come from, you see how much of the DNA and the roots are still vested inside of the car and, and what works about that car and what works uh, from a driving experience, from a performance standpoint and from an aesthetics standpoint. It's an icon. It's, it's a car that sits separate of all of its competitors. When the Porsche 901 that's how it was called at the beginning, came out in 1963. People were not sure if it's still a Porsche. Some people just disliked it. But then, when the first uh, journalists drove the car and uh, yeah, presented their, their test reports, people started loving the car. I think what's so remarkable about this car is the fact that it did follow on from the rear engine cars that Porsche produced since day one. And of course, you do have the engine and the transmission behind the center line of the rear wheels. Very quickly, the 911 became an icon of the Porsche brand. In the meantime, we have seven generations, and soon we will build the one millionth 911, more than 20,000 racing victories. But the most important thing is that uh, I think there's no other sports car which has won so many hearts. If you ask a little boy to draw a sports car, usually something like a 911 comes out. There are many, many different models of the 911, but uh, a very unique one is here at the Porsche Museum. It's a 911 police car. I met one of these uh, police officers and he told me that one day they were following a car thief and at the end he just drove to the right side and stopped and said, I can't escape from you, you are driving a Porsche. In the 70s, Porsche updated its own classic, introducing the 911 Turbo. It may not have been the first turbo introduced in the US, but it was the most important the Porsche 911 Turbo is really a moment where they're creating a supercar, where they're creating something that's fast and a little dangerous. And that 76 Turbo, again, it's a, it's a nice, it's a little monster. It's a little monster that feels familiar, but you have to respect it. The turbochargers would punch or they would hit or whatever. There was a violence to it. It was really like a turning point for the brand that they showed that, that hey, this is what a race car really feels like. Now all of a sudden, they've stuck a turbo and a big wide flare and uh, wider wheels and really pushed the envelope. I was a kid and you know you have that 930 poster that uh, so many of us have had that was like brute over the top i mean that was a, a flash of some serious car senior prom i had just picked up my date i was getting on the 210 freeway going to someone else's house and i get on the freeway and on ramps in that car was so awesome and i came up and there's a chp right in front of me i'm only going on the freeway for like two miles i'm like oh and I just legged it i'm coming up on about 50 miles an hour faster behind him and right when he got past the off ramp and he couldn't turn i went whew, reverse lights at 60 miles an hour he threw it in reverse and he came, and i came out on the edge of the crest highway sideways with my date and got up the highway and around and pulled off and my heart was it's not just a concept for me you know that car was a game changer
I have a 930 turbo myself. And when you get that car uh, going on boost, there's no time for texting. There's no time for talking. There's no time for music. Uh, that's driving. That's spirited driving. And uh, 930 turbo, it's hard to argue about something being as engaging as that car. The 80s were a turning point for Porsche. The 911 was an icon and bestseller, but the company was looking to move forward and push the limits of driving technology. People realized that Porsche was capable of changing everybody's perception. They were like the band that keeps making the hits, you know what I mean? Like you think, oh, there's no way they're gonna make another hit and blow everybody away. And guess what? Here comes another one, the 959. When the 959 came in, it really was the game changer of that era. In fact, it was the fastest car in the world and probably the most stable and showed the world that we have to go all-wheel drive. The 959, I think, truly the first supercar. It, it was sort of a quantum leap. You know, everyone's kind of saying, well, let's, let's make it a little more powerful or we'll make it a little more of this. And that was just kind of like they said, let's just, what if we started with a clean sheet and just thought about almost like the car version of going to the moon. Active ride, massive turbos. Um, everything that you quote couldn't do at that time i think that that's really a period of the purest form of the word supercar they went forward in time and they they built a car from 10 years in the future or even further than that really and then they brought it to you in the 80s it was just like head exploding when you'd read about it it's like how can this all be in one car you know no one makes a all-wheel drive with variable ride height, and, and the, you can't do that. This car combined technology, which is uh, available today, already in the mid of the 80s. Performance of the car was outstanding, and uh, it also had a, delivered a, of, a lot of luxury, and so people got crazy. They made such a statement at such an important time in their life, I think, really. I mean, they went out and did the Paris-Dakar with it and won it. I mean, to go out there and take on the world's biggest off-road rally, the toughest event of the year anywhere, and they go and win it, you know, with drivers that aren't really off-road rally drivers, they were racing drivers. You were never able to bring them into this country, so it really made everybody nuts. <laughs> and um, I remember reading about Bill Gates and how his was stuck at customs. Bill Gates and Jerry Seinfeld, who created show and display, which was a method of getting a car that wasn't really supposed to be in the country, but getting it here and through customs so that it could be shown and displayed. In, in other words, it's significant to car culture. And uh, man, if you drive it a little while, who's gonna know, <laughs> right? Do we get to talk about the Carrera GT now? I love the Carrera GT. In the 2000s, Porsche set their sights on the supercar space and delivered a car that destroyed the competition. First disruption for me with the Carrera GT, V10, mid-engine, open top car, uh, large wheelbase, a lot of new space for, for Porsche to venture in. You know, I just drove one a few weeks ago. It's wonderfully analog, as opposed to the new 918 or anything new, which has got your paddle shifters and everything else. When you drive it, I think that's the one thing that really comes out. You're more part of the car when you're shifting gear manually with your hand because you have to watch the revs and pull it through and clear the clutch. And you really are in the cockpit of a race car. The origin of this project was motorsports. In the late 90s, the Porsche engineers were working on a new racing car for Le Mans. But then there were some, some, some rules changed and uh, Porsche decided not to participate in the year 2000. But the technology, a carbon fiber chassis, a V10 naturally aspirated engine, all these uh, technologies were used for a new car and this became the Carrera GT. I was able to buy one when I was way too young. It made me a better pitcher. It changed my life. I, was, I had a 3.6 ERA before I got it, and then the rest of the season I had like a 2.2 ERA, because I was so happy. The first time I heard it rev up, it was the Monaco 2003 GP, and they rolled that car onto the front straightaway with Walter in it, and uh, I'll never forget the sound of that car. I mean, it just sounded like music and magic mixed together. I was sitting on this patio at a coffee shop in Malibu, and I heard this noise, and I'm like, what is that? And I heard it just zoom, 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 zoom. And I stood up, and I realized every guy in the place stood up, and we were like prairie dogs. Like it's an alien 
technology Swiss watch all put together. You know, it's got the craftsmanship that you expect from Porsche, but it's also got this art to it. And you can see like these kind of, these curves that look like a rocket booster you'd put on the back of a shark or something like that. But when you get in here and you look through these little laser cut holes and you see the carbon fiber oil tank in there and you see the pushrod suspension and how it all actuates with like really beautiful milled billet pieces of metal. All the other cars at the time were going automatic, making it easier to drive. This was making it more visceral, more real, more everything that a race car should be. But this is a road car. I can't believe that they actually managed to make this work, but it, it's one of the most beautiful cars of all time. It's interesting when you reflect on each generation, the 959, the Carrera GT, Every time a car comes out at that extent, you wonder, could they do any more? Could there be more of what we consider a hyper car? And each time, Porsche pushes the limit. You know, on paper, I think it was one of those things where everyone was like, whoa, four-wheel drive, hybrid, uh, you know? And then the Nordschleife lap record and all these things start to kind of, like, it line up and you see this kind of laser focus of Porsche is trying to build the absolute best car in the world. In the beginning, everybody smiled and said, are you going green now or is it for fuel consumption? And after a while, people figured out, oh wow, the performance of the car is completely different and the fuel consumption is extremely good. So that just showed the potential and it's the fastest car ever. It's the best sports car ever. It left the Nürburgring the fastest than ever before. My first drive in the 918 was using the different modes and I turned it from racing, which was very loud, to all electric and my friend was able to talk on his phone. This ability of this car to run on the highway, the car that looks like that, in full electric mode, and then to turn into a race car just like that, instantly, with a little turn of that little circling switch, you have this race car that can charge its battery by racing it. <laughs> and then you can run it in traffic without polluting. For Porsche, hybrid cars are kind of revisiting history. In 1900, Ferdinand Porsche started his career by developing electric cars and hybrid cars. Indeed, in 1900, he built the Semper Vivus, and this was the first functional hybrid car in the world. It's surreal the first time you get in, um, just getting your head around how much power uh, you have underneath you. When you go to a hybrid and the alternative, uh, just that such a direct amount of acceleration from the electricity, that was the biggest game changer for me. There still is a part of technology and user experience, and sometimes those two don't always get along, but with the 918, it's raw. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, R&D that goes into producing some of the numbers and some of the experience that it has, but in the end, you still feel that race-inspired engineering uh, behind it, and, and that's the part that's fun. It's the first of the future cars on a performance basis from the hybrid has really shown everybody that that is the way forward. The 918 is a shot across the bow of the whole car industry. The 911 with the little back jump seats, it's good for my, my boys because they're six and eight, but you know, you want to share that experience with people. Um, and, and you know, maybe your, your, your wife and another couple. The Panamera comes along and now here you go. The Panamera is showing that you can take a four-door car that's really underneath the skin, a sports car, and and you're able to kind of mush the, the attributes together so that you're not compromising. It was true to Porsche, which is we want a car that is a true driver's car. It just happened to have a second row of seats. And when you're in the cockpit of the Panamera, you forget there's, there's, there's seats behind you. You jump inside, you quickly respond and connect with driving position, with ergo. Um, everything before you even turn the key and start it up. It's um, a car that sort of everything you throw out and it's ready to deliver. And then again, you sort of snap out of it and realize um, you're driving a, a, a luxury car. I had a whole day at the Nürburgring with Hans Stuck. I was in a turbo uh, the 911, he was in the Panamera and we swapped over. That was an amazing comparison between the two. I mean, that Panamera could stay with the turbo. That one out there now, I think, will be a little bit quicker than a turbo. I think race car drivers are always 
good judges for for modern technology and and uh, and for high performance cars and with CJ Wilson and Patrick Long I think we have two really good types of these drivers one more from the amateur side one of the high end professionals one of the definitely best sports car race drivers in the US and I think you can trust their judgment this is the kind of cool experience that we're having right now. We're, uh, we're driving someone else's cars on a, on a track. Yeah, it's kind of hard to complain when you tell people you have to get up early on Monday morning and come out and drive some beautiful new cars around a private facility. We don't have to pay for tires, right? It has the sports car silhouette. As the cars evolve now, I mean, I'm looking at it and it's taken on its own identity. Like now the Panamera is identifiable as a Panamera. Not only do you have the, the wing, but you have the, the, the rear lights and everything, the kind of cluster that looks very, very advanced. I just, I just like looking at it, man. It's like watching you go through these corners and stuff like that, seeing as much yaw as you're able to create, um, but also looking at like right over the hip and seeing that, that supercar hip that you have right over the fuel door. Yeah, it's fun that there's still so much design aspect to these cars. I mean, you see the silhouette of the 911, but you also see, like you said, so much evolution in the hips and sort of that bulk masculinity through the back that still says sports car. I love that you can hustle a four-door car this hard, sub four seconds, zero to 60, but one of the most proud attributes of these cars for me is that you can hustle the car all day long. It's not like you put down the numbers for the magazine test and uh, then you gotta go cool it off for a couple laps. I mean, this car can be punished, whether it's launch control or just hammering some laps as we're doing here. This thing hauls ass. We're here selfishly just ripping these cars around the track. We got four seats, man. Let's go pick up some buddies. Yeah, we need to share this experience. I said, uh, 8,000 bucks. Hey, guys. We got extra seats if you guys want to hop in. Is this uh, Uber Pool? Should be on it harder than that. But... <laughs> oh, you're beating me, you, you son of a what mother, happened? you bad. How is it back there, Mr. Bell? Are you I comfortable? It, I, I never thought I'd sit in the back of Panamera, actually. I'm following the other car just now and looking out, it's a very elegant shape to it, it really now. It's much more, uh, you know, elegance and, and sort of got class. Yeah, there's few cars out there where you don't feel bad when you give uh, another couple the back seats to go to dinner. We're a couple now. We are, there's no chance there, boy. Eh? Okay, no lie, I gotta take a break. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I gotta, I gotta subtract a passenger. He's tapping out, tapping out. Well, now Liz, what do you like in a car? What are the things that you look for? Obviously, you, you like performance, you're, you know, you, you've got the bug. You don't like to sneak in quietly in the no, back. No, 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 I'm Brazilian, you know, I, I like to make noise. You gotta stand out a little bit, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the back now. I was driving earlier. I can actually change the stereo from the back. So you can be, you can be a backseat DJ along with being a backseat passenger. Well, that's good, because I don't think you're getting the steering wheel back anytime soon from, <laughs> from what I can tell. So at least you have something to, to occupy you and uh, at least give you some semblance that you're in control. I've got a chilled water, and I'm just watching my wife go to work right here. It's pretty interesting. Mr. Bell, Mr. Kendall, Mr. Long, and Mrs. Wilson, I've, I've had a great time, but uh, let's see if Spike's uh, turn back to normal colors. <laughs> Porsche just unveiled another brand new version of the 2017 Panamera. This is an exclusive look at the world's newest disruptor, coming straight from Vesak, Germany. The question is always what comes after 918 and, and what will be the next car from Porsche that is mind-blowing and, and really disruptive. And in this case now, it's, it's the Panamera Turbo S e-hybrid. Many of the guys that did the 918 switched over in the Panamera project and they brought all their ideas they had in mind in the car. 
in the, in the second generation of the first Panamera had a hybrid. That was more about efficiency, and we learned from the, from the 918 Spider that hybrid is also a, a key issue in terms of performance. And so this, this hybrid is really a, a performer, and it's a fuel saver also. The number one in priority was this feeling and, and the driving modes and the behavior of the car, that it should be in the Panamera the same like the 918 with the drive mode, with the map switch and the steering wheel and, and all these things. And for sure, the assembly with the engine, the electric drivetrain or the electric motor, and then uh, a PDK, a, a double clutch gearbox, because nobody else uses a hybrid in combination with a double clutch. And all the software behind that, how to shift and, and how to integrate the electric motor in this complex drivetrain, that went all over. The figures are quite impressive. The result of combining the combustion engine with the electric hybrid system is a total power of 680 horsepower and 627 pound-feet of torque. The acceleration will be below 3.3 seconds uh, from 0 to 60 miles per hour. It will be the, the fastest luxury car in the world and it's a hybrid. Porsche's design team is constantly on the path to drive automotive disruption. And their most important vision is still in the works, the Mission E. Decade after decade, these iconic Porsche vehicles change the world. And Porsche has no plans to stop. What is that feeling that makes you feel like a kid again? What is that captivative energy that just makes you want to drive? Porsche came in to sort of disrupt, if you like, and to say, hey, we're here, we're going to make a real mark in the future. And of course, that was how it all began. It's a consistency that they are able to bring to the table with all these different either lightweight cars, race cars for the road, or taking a technology that used to only live in aerospace, and now it's a road car technology. It's, they just, they keep at it. Porsche is the ultimate disruptor.